Welcome, I'm Dr. Petra Krum, your host for the 2021 ASD webinar series. This webinar series is presented by Music Therapy Consulting and features authors with research-based updates of the book Early Childhood Music Therapy and Autism Spectrum Disorder, supporting young children and their families. During this webinar, we invite you to socialize in the chat. Please use the Q&A for any questions you have. We will address them at the end of the webinar. As we might not be able to answer all questions, you can upload them, which will prioritize them. Today, I'm welcoming back Marsha Humble. She joins me with her special guests, Terry Plain and Michael DeSisto. Marsha is the co-editor of the book, Early Childhood Music Therapy and Autism Spectrum Disorder. She is the recipient of the AMTA's Lifetime Achievement Award and celebrated for her work in early intervention, ASD, community, and school settings. Her guest and my former student, Terry Blaine, is a singer and a music therapist. She has enjoyed a multifaceted career, including live performances, recording, studio work, TV and radio shows, songwriting, production, and television. Terry is a music therapy program leader at Hudson Valley Hospice since 2008 and offers compassionate care to patients and families, training music therapy interns and fieldwork students, and providing supervision to students and staff. She is best known simply as Michael's mom. And Michael's sister, he is a multi-instrumentalist, singer, and music instructor who sang before he talked. He has perfect pitch and can easily memorize and sing music that he loves. Diagnosed with autism in 2007, special education supports paired with music helped Michael successfully navigate early challenges to make music his path in life. He remains a strong advocate for autism awareness, encouraging students with disabilities to pursue their passions and work hard to make their dreams come true. Welcome to all of you. Marsha? I am so excited to have Terry and Michael with us tonight. In the first edition of Dr. Kearns and my book uh, on autism spectrum disorder and parents and children, I examined the topic of parents and children with autism spectrum disorder. Parents of children with ASD are thrust into a role that invariably brings denial, frustration, and desperation, but also deep feelings of commitment, love, and joy. Research has indicated that these parents experience such stressors as loneliness, the inability to understand the child's wants, needs, and inappropriate behavior, guilt, anxiety, extreme difficulty of navigating the system, too little or too much information, and uncertainty about the child's future. Because statistically, it seems logical that there are music therapists who have been thrust into a dual role as a parent and a professional. I interviewed four music therapists for the first edition of the book from various areas in the United States who had children with ASD. And I learned that they had many of the same experiences reported in the literature. But they also had some distinctly unique experiences of being both a parent and a professional. In the second edition of the book, I revisited these families and learned of the progress the children had made as they transitioned to adolescence and also into young adulthood. I am very, very thrilled to have with us tonight one of those music therapist moms and her son, Terry and Michael. Terry, a little bit about you first. There were so many things that Michael and Terry told us about themselves as they moved into this phase of their lives. I would love to spend time and tell you everything about all their major accomplishments, but because we want to hear more about them from themselves, let me just give you a thumbnail sketch of a touch of what Terry has done in her magnificent career. She was born in New York City and she sent bank back up from Frankie Valley in the Four Seasons. My generation is so impressed with that. I loved the Four Seasons, uh, sang jingles, and has recorded uh, this wonderful CD, Whose Honey Are You?, which is a jazz journal international record of the year. 
So, so many of these wonderful professional performing accomplishments, but in 2008, Terry went on and earned a master's degree in music therapy. So thank you so much for joining us today, Terry. And Michael, it's so good to finally see you in person, having heard your story. And Michael was born in Manhattan, but the family soon relocated to Woodstock in New York. And at an early age, Michael um, had memorized, and this just blew me away when I read this, Mozart's 40th Symphony and themes to Jeopardy and Star Trek, The Next Generation. But Michael had some trouble um, paying attention and understanding what he had read, and he felt anxious in social situations. Now at Woodstock, Michael participated in a wide range of musical activities though. And he began, he learned how to um, work in a recording studio and playing arrangements of uh, the Beatles, Eleanor Rigby performed with different ensembles and did all sorts of these fun things. And as you shall see and hear, Michael's love of music always shined through. It's an honor to have you with us, Michael. So let's look at the back at the beginning of your journey, Terry. You had to con you continue and have still at a music run as a performer, but what made you decide to become a music therapist? Well, Marcia, thank you so much for having us. It's great to be here with you and welcome everyone. I, I you know, I kind of feel like music therapy kind of found me. Um, I, it, back in 2002, I had an interest in um, end of life caregiving. So I attended a seminar in New York City. And over the weekend, at the end of the weekend, the teacher said to me, well, if you're really interested in this, you know, compassionate care at the bedside, um, do you have a hospice near you where you could volunteer? And I said, yeah, you know, I had the one that I work at now, Hudson Valley Hospice was right in Kingston, New York. So he suggested that I go there and I did. And I spoke to the coordinator of volunteer services, Terry St. John, who said, oh, you're a musician you should meet uh, Dr. Russell Hilliard. He just started a music therapy program here. And I went, wow, what's music therapy, <laughs> right? That's everybody's first question, what is it? So she gave me the, you know, the short uh, answer. And when I called Dr. Hilliard, he said, oh, you're a, a musician and a hospice volunteer. Well, you should come take my class. Guess what? I'm teaching uh, intro to music therapy this fall uh, at uh, SUNY New Paltz, which is 20 minutes from my house. So uh, I, I did, and I, I took his class, and I, I absolutely loved it. I mean, I loved it. I loved all the kids. We just had a great time. And of course, that's also where I met Dr. Kern, and she was my teacher, which was amazing. And Dr. Mary Boyle was also there, and Eleanor Dennis, uh, people, just a wonderful crew of people. And, um, but once I saw what music therapy could do in the hospice setting, I, I was really, really hooked because I felt like then I could combine these two loves of mine. I want to you know, be contemplative and compassionate at the bedside and I wanna do music. So I didn't know there was such a thing as a hospice and palliative care music therapist, a thing I never knew that existed before. So, wow, that's kind of hooked me right there. Well, that's always an inspiring story to hear people who had didn't even know music therapy existed to moved on to be such a, a leader in the field as you have done. So, um, but Michael was young when you began your music educa music therapy education. So you must have been incredibly busy at that time. You know, yeah, we, we really were. I mean, he was almost 10 when I started studying. Um, well, it was challenging, but we were lucky that we, we already lived up here and we had a very good, uh, he was in a very good uh, elementary school at that time that met, was meeting his needs. And Tom and I were working out of our home. We were freelancers then, and I was still doing a lot of performing. So we were able to juggle the caregiving role and you know uh, all our responsibilities. And when I went on the road, our families were nearby. So his mom was able to come up and be with Michael a lot of the times when we traveled or he went down to her house over the weekend. So his, his routine wasn't interrupted all that much, but it was funny. We just had our office painted. And when I cleaned it out, I found all these assignments for Dr. Hilliard's class from 2003. <laughs> And I had actually faxed him an assignment from the, some airport hotel in Cleveland. So it wasn't without its challenges and we were crazy and busy, but somehow we got through it. I wish you would have known you were in Cleveland. I live about 
20 miles from Cleveland <laughs> <laughs> at that time <laughs> now. And we could have gotten together and met years yeah. before. So, right. <laughs> at the time, though, did you have any idea that Michael was also extremely talented and gifted in music? Yeah, you know, we had, we had a, a, a good idea pretty early on because when Michael was about 18 months old, I'll never forget this because we had a friend over and he was sitting in a high chair eating peas off a tray. And, um, you know, the Jeopardy theme was on and he was, you know, TV was on, he was eating. You know, he's singing da, 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 da. And he gets to the end, you know, da, 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 da. And he makes the modulation, da, 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 da. And I think all of us pretty much fell off our chairs at that point because it was like, wow, this is, you know, this is a tremendous musical gift. This is a, you know, a given gift. And, you know, uh, from there, his sweet little voice uh, developed, you know, he had a tremendous uh, gift for music, for rhythm and for hearing melody. And, um, you know, he was very, very shy to sing in front of other people at first. So that's why I think it worked out well for him to start in the studio because it was mostly just us. And he became a violinist for that reason, I think, because he didn't want to sing in public uh, at first anyway. But um, anyway, we, I think we have a short clip of Michael singing I Can Be Brave, which is a song he wrote for a class project in 2003. So here it is. Yes, and I will share this. And Michael, I love that song. I can be brave, I can be strong In my heart I know there's nothing wrong I'll sing my song, I'll ride the wave If I feel afraid I can be brave Every time I hear that, Michael, I am even more impressed. So thanks, Terry, for sharing that with us. Michael, can you tell us what are some of your earliest memories of making music? Well, hello, Marsha. It's a pleasure to be with you this evening. You're welcome. Um, as you mentioned, I love singing along to both uh, classical and popular music uh, from a very early age. Um, when we first moved to Woodstock, um, I had more opportunities to do different things. Um, when I went to the Waldorf Kindergarten School, we did a thing called Eurythmy, which was a kind of um, different music and movement. Um, later on, I learned how to play the recorder and then the violin, which my mom had mentioned before. I had a wonderful private violin teacher named Betty McDonald. Um, she taught me uh, classical and jazz on the violin. And she also introduced me to the keyboard, uh, which I would play at the end of each lesson. We did some improvising, which was really cool because I could make up my own melodies and feel comfortable being creative. Betty also always hosted uh, talent shows that featured all of her private students, including myself. I would participate just about every year, either on the violin or and or, you know, singing. One of my top favorite performances um, was uh, singing and playing violin on the Alan Jackson song, Little Bitty. Um, I performed it at the Colony Cafe in Woodstock. It's now called The Colony. Uh, my mom, my dad, and Betty sang back up. Um, she also uh, recorded me once or twice a year. One thing I remember doing was taping a cassette around Christmas time. Um, and uh, the cassette was called Michael Plays and Sings, which I still have somewhere in the house. Um, singing has uh, always been a huge part of who I am, so. Fantastic, Michael. Um, Terry, when did you discern that Michael may have developmental differences? Well, in his early play dates when he was a toddler, he did a lot of parallel play. He played with alongside other kids, but not really engaging one-to-one. Uh, -one. Um, he walked later than his peers, but he uh, talked and decoded words uh, very, very early. I would say from the beginning, uh, there was just, he was always on his own timetable developmentally. So there were some things that were, you know, he did very early and others where there were slightly or significant delays. Um, a great example of this was an early comprehensive assessment that we did where uh, he, he, um, he scored 90, in the 99th percentile for decoding words, recognizing what he saw word-wise, but in the second percentile for comprehension. 
So this is like the op complete opposite end. And that, a lot of that was kind of what we were presented with early on, was like these the tremendous extremes. But you know, his semantic and pragmatic speech really needed to come up. Um, so until he got older, it was kind of hard to gauge what he could actually, you know, where he actually was because of these, you know, big, big extremes at the beginning. But luckily for us, we had an amazing team of people at the Phoenicia School, the elementary school, especially the school psychologist who used to say to the IEP team, don't let the numbers define this kid. You know, he is, you know, the best memory, not only of any kid, of any person in this building. And um, you know, don't let the test numbers define them too much yet. Let's just give them more time. So that that just kind of became my mantra. I think you know, let's just you know, he just needs maybe he just needs more time. Such good I advice you got there. I think that phrase "don't let the numbers define you" is is something we can all recognize to look at the pluses, right? The real positives. But um, where and from whom did you and your husband seek understanding and help? Well, at that time, you know, we had some testing done at the Spectrum Services up here in Kingston right after we moved. And we did have in-home services for a while, uh, but decided after a time, again, you know, to let him have his own development. And, and we stopped those, which I later regretted, especially once I started studying music therapy and had a sense of how important zero to five years old is. <laughs> then you kind of look back at that and went, you know, wish I'd stayed with that, you know, but, you know, we did what we did. Um, and after a, a disappointing initial attempt at a preschool placement, we found a beautiful placement for him in Woodstock with a, a two older women. Uh, they were the lead and the assistant teacher. It was right in town and it was very warm and welcoming. And, you know, he did really great there. He didn't have any particular special education supports, but there was something about the energy and the, the feeling and the, you know, that sense of being, the kids were being held by the energy of the place. So that was another good lesson of like, maybe it's not about what support exactly it is, but how does he feel when he's there? Uh, does he make friends? He made friends there. He met his, a friend of his that he's still friends with and we're still friends with the lead teacher, you know, and he just kind of blossomed. And I, I have to say also, I was very lucky to have my mother-in-law, Lucy, uh, Tom's mom, who he, she just died last year, but she had raised five kids and she'd seen it all. And you know, we kind of really leaned on her for advice. You know, she had that idea, you know, well, you know, the same thing, give them a chance. You know, all the kids come along, they all find their way, don't worry so much. And, you know, it was tough to discern always like, where's that line between how much support to give and how much to allow just a person to develop and to have an experience of life and see, you know, what's a good blend there. So when we would worry or we'd have setbacks, you know, she was a great source of strength and sanity, uh, loving, very non-judgmental, and um, very, you know, very great common sense, you know, so that was helpful. And my mom was a wonderful musician and uh, she was a child uh, piano prodigy. So she was tickled to death that Michael had musical talent. And, you know, the two grandmas were always in the front row of like every early, uh, performance that he did. They were all such a big help to us. Well, Michael, it looks like you had some good genes, music genes that came your way from, from uh, all sorts of people in your family. Now you mentioned uh, in your bio, the special education supports you received before and after being diagnosed with autism in 2007. Could you give us a little more information on the types of support you experienced? Mm -hmm. Well, when I first went to Phoenicia Elementary School, I was in a combined classroom of grades two and three, which had both a teacher and an aide. I also had a lot of one-to-one one -one supports for speech, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and math. But later on, I had less one-to-one -one support and more special education classes with other kids. I also had orchestra once a week, plus a mini we weekly mini lesson with the school strings teacher. I had testing with the school psychologist in the second and fifth grade to see how I was progressing. And when I was in eighth grade, uh, the school requested a comprehensive assessment that was done by an independent psychologist in Pennsylvania. This gave me my official diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder, which was then called Asperger's syndrome. 
Um, which of those uh, supports do you think or those interventions were especially helpful to you? Uh, definitely playing in the orchestra was the most helpful because it gave me a lot more confidence. And as I was playing in the orchestra, I learned how to listen to what other people were doing. And I um, made more friends uh, during that time. When we did our winter and spring concerts, uh, we would perform in the afternoon for the kids and the teachers and at night time for the parents and the community. That was when I realized how music uh, brightened up people's lives and made them feel great. I was always happy to entertain and I felt like I wanted to continue to do more playing. Great insight learned at a very young age, I must say. So uh, Terry, let's go back and see what roadblocks did you and your family encounter in those early days? Well, you know, not every situation we tried was a good fit. And I, I really tended to avoid confrontation early on, which I think, you know, in hindsight, wasn't always the best approach. I mean, you have to be willing to stand up and fight for your child, but you also have to acknowledge where you are in reality in the present moment. And when adjustments or changes need to be made, you know, like Michael said before, you have to list, learn to listen and um, engage with people who have other points of view. Cause you know, we're, it's like our goal is the same to support and, and help the, you know, the child about what's the best way to do that. And I, I have to say that I really relate Marsha to what you said earlier, um, you know, that there were times when I really was in denial um, or felt desperate, certainly inadequate as a parent and by extension as a person, you know, I was, um, uh, when I fell into this kind of state of mind, I, I really did feel like I didn't know uh, what to do or, or what might be a, a path forward for Michael. And I have to say, I was very hard on myself when I made mistakes or what I perceived as mistakes uh, or um, if I didn't take a, a firm enough stand on an issue or made poor choices, um, I was just hard on myself. You know, so many things, so many things that we tried early on that didn't work out, you know, we take that responsibility on, like we tried with the Waldorf School to get it started in this area, that didn't work out. And then we had therapeutic writing that we used to do. And that's not that that didn't work out. It was just too far away. And once he was in elementary school, we couldn't continue it. But I, I grieved the things that we couldn't continue. You know what I mean? And, uh, but in retrospect, I think Michael benefited from all of them because for him, he wasn't looking for a solution. He was just enjoying all of these different things that were being offered to him. So again, another great lesson. Sounds like a lot of things were offered, which is super. You know, we can't have too many experiences, right? But what, what, let's go look on the positive. What was the most helpful in your opinion? Well, hands down, I think it was finding the Phoenicia Elementary School, which again was a stroke of luck. We were at the playground and we ran into a lead teacher from that school who had just retired. Michael was like seven. And she said, oh, you should check it out. It's a progressive school. The, you know, the classrooms are combined. All the teachers had special ed training. Um, many of the classrooms were combined grades. And um, most of Michael's special education supports once he got there were pullouts, you know, where the rest of the time he was in the classroom with his typical peers. And this is a great story too. When we brought him there on the first day, um, you know, we were really, I was really nervous. I don't think Tom was as nervous as me, but I was really nervous. And then he had this, you know, like the door opened and there was Mrs. Oaks. And it was like, you know, cue the strings. It was love at first sight. And he took one look at her and she took one look at him and he just walked in to the classroom and she said, well, take off your coat and this is where you hang your coat. And then they looked at us and they went, you can leave now. <laughs> and then we actually felt like not horrified to leave, but okay, you know, this is good. He's in, he's happy. Um, you know, uh, this is wonderful. And then um, the special ed teacher who also became a very good friend that we're still friends with today, uh, she immediately set up something for him that was perfect, you know, just a great series of things that were very helpful to him. But she was also really tuned into us. Like she wasn't going to push a diagnosis on us before we were ready to accept one, you know, and she was gentle with us. And so we had a tremendous sense of trust for that team. You know, we loved them and trusted them with, with Michael, but also to be honest with us. And um, I felt like I stepped up a little bit and I was able to say more, you know, can engage a little bit more which was great. We felt seen and heard and supported as a family. And I'll never forget the one thing that she said to me early on was, gee, I wish I'd had him two years ago. 
you know, so that's the thing that every parent goes, you know, why didn't I think of this two years ago? But I said, well, you know, rather than kick myself, I start to practice, you know, they've got this, he's in good hands. Maybe I can relax a little bit and, you know, just um, realize that we had the right help and we're in a good, we're in a good place. What role did music play throughout all of this? Well, I think in and out of school, music was always a strength for Michael. You know, he worked very hard to meet the goals on his IEP for all of the non-music subjects, but music gave him successful experiences all the time and also, um, you know, allowed him to be naturally a part of a group. Um, socially, it was just so beneficial, I can't say enough. Um, he was able to be himself and he found a lot of acceptance and a lot of high positive attitudes all the way through, which was just a great blessing. Was your professional expertise respected by those who um, worked with Michael early in these days? You know, I think so. I think they knew that Tom and I were musicians and there were a lot of professional musicians in our area in and obviously in and around Woodstock, there's lots of us. So, um, and a lot of them had young kids. So we would show up and uh, be in and around the school programs. And um, I remember, you know, one of the spring concerts I sang with the jazz band and I did a solo with you know, one of the other parents who was a jazz pianist and some of the kids came here to our home studio to record. Um, we became friends with the music teachers. And, you know, they were very supportive of me once I started to study music therapy, they were interested in it. And then later on, I was invited to mentor a student who um, did a, a senior project on music therapy. That was a lot of fun. So uh, music or music therapy was part of his formal treatment plan? Then, in the in the in the sense that um, yes, that that there was orchestra, there was so many opportunities in our school district. They had a tremendous music program, including the strings program, which is very unusual. Went all the way from second to twelfth grade, um, but there were no formal music therapy services at that time. Um, although Michael did get to participate in a lot of groups, large and small, in and out of school, and several that. You know, he, he was recruited into, into, into the community that performed live every year and recorded together every year. So that was great. Yeah. So let's move on to your life as you entered adolescence and adulthood, Michael. By this time, you'd been living in Woodstock for several years. So let's move on. Can you tell us about your experiences in high school? Well, um, I attended um, Antiora High School and I graduated with a local diploma in 2011. So. Ten, so it's going to be 10 years ago, like in a month. Wow. I had some, I definitely had some challenges during that time, especially at first. I remember uh, my mom and I visited the school before the day, to, before the first day to locate every classroom I'd be in. My special ed team was a little worried that I'd have a hard time making transitions between classes or that I'd have anxiety about it, but I really didn't have anxiety. However, I did start having test anxiety in high school. So for certain subjects, my scores on tests were sometimes good and other times not so good. But I worked with my school counselor, uh, Ms. Evers, and my speech therapist, Ms. Hansel, to control the anxiety and learn how to stay positive when I had to take a test. But I also had some wonderful successes in high school. I discovered that I had a better feel for math and I did very well in that subject. I even took a college level math class in algebra and trigonometry, which was called Math 115. I had testing accommodations and supports um, in English, science, and social studies. And I started participating more in my IEP meetings. My high school also had a wonderful music program. And I had so many opportunities to play in different ensembles on the violin. My two um, high school orchestra teachers, Mrs. Pato, who I had for um, ninth and 10th grade, and Mrs. Boyer, who I had for 11th and 12th grade, also encouraged me to try more challenging th things, even if I wasn't comfortable at first. I even was the high school concert orchestra concert master, and I was part of the area all-state orchestra in my senior year. I also played with a string quartet called the B Sharp Quartet, and I was in all county orchestra for all four years of my high school life. I was in the Ontario High School Chamber Ensemble from 10th to 12th grade. And starting in junior year, I joined the SUNY New Paltz College Youth Symphony, which would rehearse on Sunday evenings. 
I got to know Vic Ezzo and Marka Young, who shared the conducting role that year. I even earned some academic achievement awards every year. And during my senior year, I earned a couple of scholarships. And that helped me make the transition to college. That's one amazing uh, uh, resume there of all that you accomplished. Uh, that's a lifetime's worth of accomplishments that you did in high school. But Terry, uh, after going through all those wonderful things with Michael in high school, uh, then came graduation. For all parents, I think that is that is a whew, moment and uh, oh no, what's next moment. So uh, were you concerned about what was the next step in Michael's journey? And how did you as parents help him navigate that, those steps? Yeah, I think there's a lot more written about early childhood, you know, uh, how to you know, the supports in aut with autism. And then I think once high school ends, it's sort of like a whole other other thing. But, you know, Michael learned to drive in his senior year and he became a lot more independent. He was able to go back and forth from work and school and, and kind of be more on his own. But um, he was clearly heading into music, but, you know, we, we tried to figure a good way to get him going. He wanted to continue to study. But like he said, since he got the, the local diploma, he had one path, but that actually worked out great for us that he would go to a two year college and then he would be able to, you know, uh, transfer to a four year school. But we were, again, ex once again, extremely lucky that our two year community college, SUNY Ulster, had a terrific uh, music program and a wonderful set of special education supports. So um, we talked to his you know, high school guidance counselor and she in introduced us to the New York State VESID program, which is special ed program for young adults in New York who want to either go into the workforce or continue their education. Um, they coordinated services for him at SUNY Ulster that were very strong educational and, and counseling supports, but also encouraged um, developing independence and confidence and, and success. Um, many of the teachers at SUNY Ulster and SUNY New Paltz worked at both places. You know, they, they either taught or played in each other's ensembles. So it was very natural for him to go from one school to the other, he was already playing in groups at both schools. And he stayed at Ulster an extra year to complete his general ed. So when he transferred to New Paltz, um, he was able to really concentrate on music there. So it was, you know, a little bit rocky, but once this, again, once this path emerged, it was like, okay, here we go. So we just followed along. Michael, I see from this information you provided that you earned an associate degree in music performance at SUNY Ulster in 2014 and a bachelor's degree in contemporary music study with a pre-music therapy track, no less, at SUNY New Paltz in 2016. These are major accomplishments for any young man. So your music talent obviously served you very well during these years. Can you tell us some of the musical highlights that you remember from those years? Well, when I first went to SUNY Ulster, I started playing the violin with the SUNY Ulster String Ensemble. Um, after that, like after that semester, like my second semester, I joined the community concert band on the upright bass. My teacher, who I actually mentioned before, um, um, when I mentioned the SUNY New Paltz uh, College Youth Symphony, uh, Mr. Vic, Vic Izzo, he was the one who encouraged me to play the bass in that group. And eventually that became my main instrument. I had also played several convocations on both violin and bass. A convocation is like a little mini recital that would happen like, you know, every other Wednesday during that time at Ulster. During my third semester at Ulster, I added the wind ensemble to the mix and I was playing bass more often and loving it so much. I also met one of my new best friends at um, SUNY Ulster. His name is Daniel O'Brien, who had been diagnosed with autism as well and was in the music department with me. He also transferred to SUNY New Paltz with me and we uh, worked together a lot. In the spring of 2013, um, I also played first violin with a classical trio. And in the fall 2013, I started taking piano lessons. And by the spring of 2014, like my last semester at um, SUNY Ulster, since I did an extra year there, as my mom mentioned before, I gave an honors recital on piano and I performed the Sonatina in C major by Museo Clementi. I also gave honors recitals on both the violin and the bass. And I even tutored my buddy Daniel in music history and music theory. Those experiences at Ulster were very good. Now, when I transferred to SUNY New Paltz, I, uh, I had continued to be part of the College Youth Symphony 
uh, first on the violin. And then I switched to the bass. Like my second semester, I went to New Paltz. I also joined the symphonic band and the chamber jazz ensemble also on the bass. And by 2015, I had moved on from the violin. In my second year, um, in my second year, I uh, played the bass on different senior projects uh, by different music composition students. And it was so great to play music written by my new New Paltz friends. I loved um, the music therapy classes that I also, that I took there as well. Um, when I took uh, Intro to Music Therapy in fall of 2014, I got to observe two different board certified music therapists and I learned a lot about how to work with different clients. The year after, um, fall 2015, I took Music Therapy Methods and Materials and I did an audio biography, which was great fun. And it took me back through music I had done from childhood to the present. Another class that I was uh, required to take during that same year was Psychology of Music. And when I took that course, I did a literature review on performance anxiety, and it showed how people can overcome their fears and be successful. And I also worked with my buddy Daniel on jazz theory. I had to take that course as well. And I also gave him uh, upright bass lessons too. During my final um, semester at SUNY New Paltz, I did an independent music study um, and it absolutely changed my life. Um, Dr. Michael Viega assigned Daniel and me to an internship at Xylophone, which is a performing arts center for people with disabilities. Our boss, Debbie Major, taught me so much about how to work with people of all ages and abilities. I started setting up and leading karaoke and assisting with classes like music and movement, improvisational drumming, and dance. After the internship was over, this, is actually, this actually happened a few weeks after um, we graduated, um, Daniel and I were hired by Xylophone as music instructors. And I learned how to lead activities on my own. And I also had more opportunities to perform there. Daniel and I even co-starred in an original musical, The Luckiest Penny by Deborah Weed, which featured performers with disabilities. This show taught a beautiful lesson about the value of every, every individual and that people can work through their challenges and make their dreams come true. And I also learned that music-based activities are not only fun to do, but they also help people improve their quality of life, learn new skills, and develop meaningful relationships. Spoken like a music therapist, Michael. So <laughs> these accomplishments are amazing. So um, we're getting short on time, but I really would like you to tell me a little bit about the hurdles you had to overcome along the way. Uh, can you address some of those, Michael? Yes, I will. Um, well, when I first went to college, one hurdle was uh, making new friends right away. Um, I was shy to begin with. But once I met Daniel and joined some music ensembles, I definitely felt more comfortable around others. Another challenge for me was being independent while taking non-music courses. There was a lot more reading and writing in college, and I had a hard time uh, understanding what I read. I also had a hard time putting things into my own words when it came to writing um, like big papers and stuff like that. But that got better once I started going to the writing center a few days a week, and I worked with uh, Deb Springer and she helped me organize my thoughts. Overall, I still did pretty well with my general ed courses. I may have failed a couple of tests early on, but once I got a handle on my test anxiety and once I got more familiar with the criteria, it got better and I even started using a stress ball to, you know, I even, even used a stress ball to, you know, calm down more. When I went to SUNY New Paltz, I had a lot of um, uh, papers to write there too. And um, those were, always kind of, they were always difficult for me, but I still managed to get good grades on them. And I worked really hard with multiple tutors and I just, you know, stuck with it and, and didn't give up at all. So mom, your turn. <laughs> well, I think, you know, as Michael got older, he really started doing more on his own. And isn't that always the goal anyway, for him to become more independent and take on more. So I really had to learn the hurdle for me was to really to learn to let go and just let him know that we love him and that we support him uh, and that we're proud of him. And, you know, just to be there as traveling along with him on his journey, not um, unlike what we learn as music therapists, that we're accompanying people on their journeys. And it's such a privilege to do that. 
And then we could just not be so hard on ourselves and relax. So there's, that's that. <laughs> that brings us up to today. So both of you have had more amazing, uh, wonderful experiences and really packed resumes. So Terry, first of all, bring us up to speed real quickly on what's going on in your life. Real quick, I, I still love to perform, haven't done it as much because I'm, you know, I love my work at Hudson Valley Hospice where I have the privilege of accompanying patients and families at the end of life and training students and doing all kinds of great stuff. And I have to say, um, you know, I'm a member of the exam committee, the CBMT exam committee, which I adore. Thank you, Petra. And um, it's just been great to look back. At, I just feel so blessed, so appreciative for this journey and, you know, just, just what we have learned um, may it all be a benefit. Thank you. Uh, Michael, so in summary, can you give us an update on what you're doing these days? Well, I currently deliver pizza a couple of nights a week at Caskill Mountain Pizza uh, located in Woodstock. Uh, starting June 11th, at 10 days from now, I'm going to be playing ele both electric and upright bass in the pit orchestra of the Woodstock Playhouse. Uh, for their summer musicals. This is good. This, this coming season is going to be my sixth ever season doing that. And the shows I'm playing this summer are Fame, Evita, and Sweet Charity. Um, earlier, I had mentioned about Xylophone. Unfortunately, Xylophone had closed down due last October due to the uh, uh, COVID pandemic. But in February of this year, I started a new job similar to Xylophone called Holistic Imaginations. Um, which provides online music and game activities for kids, tweens, and young adults with disabilities. I, I was honored to be uh, the fun and games instructor. I've been playing a lot of fun games like Hangman, Trivia, What's That Song? It's all good stuff. I'm also a strong advocate for autism awareness and inclusion. I was proud to be honored as a young champion at the Stewart Air Force Base in 2017 for my work with Xylophone. And in 2019, um, my buddy Daniel and I presented at the Bridges program at SUNY Orange, encouraging students with disabilities to pursue their passions and always ask for help if need be. As my confidence as a music instructor grew, I was also hired to teach beginner piano to older adults at OU BOCES in Goshen. I haven't been able to do that recently because of COVID, but I'm hoping to uh, be back teaching in the month of September or October. Teaching music to others has also help me manage my anxiety and behaviors, push past my comfort zone, and focus on giving clients what they need to succeed. I really believe that everyone can make their dreams come true if they keep working hard and never give up. Thank you both for joining me on this webinar. It's been so inspiring and your stories are poignant and inspirational. But we have a special treat for our viewers because to close, I'd like to share with our audiences a final statement first that Michael noted on his bio. One of my special dreams did come true in March, 2020. Michael was a contestant and the big winner on his favorite game show, Wheel of Fortune. Take a look. R-S-T-L-N-E, let's get some letters up there, please. Okay, Michael, now you have to go to work with three more consonants and one more vowel. C. To one. D. Two. G. And a vowel. O. Oh. Well, some pretty good choices. You're going to get some help. I hope it's enough. Ask our audience not to provide any help, please. <laughs> you know, he's really having a good night, isn't he? Uh, I think he has a clue about this. Event, 10 seconds, good luck. A glorious occasion! He picked the right letters, that's for sure. Wow. And look what he picked up. $50,000! Michael, you could hang 10 with a boatload of cash. $50,000! That was amazing. Congratulations, Thank Michael. <laughs> Thank you, Petra. Thank you very much. Indeed, indeed, an example of pure joy. And 
I am touched and impressed to know that I have seen, I personally have met someone who won on Wheel of Fortune. That is so, so fantastic. So thank you both so very much for sharing your incredible and inspiring stories with us. Uh, it's been a joy hearing from you and getting to have you with us. Thank you so much for having thank us. Thank you, Petra and Marcia. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you. So we actually have a question from Dorothy, who was listening tonight at this webinar, and she wants to know from you, Michael. She says, Michael, your song from when you were a kid is so beautiful. Do you still write songs? What inspires you in songwriting? Well, every now and then I, you know, um, every now and then I like try to think about um, what, um, what I want to write about. You know, I actually, um, I um, should have mentioned this too. A couple of years ago, I actually wrote two songs with a guy named uh, James Glasgow. Um, I actually sang, I sang on both songs. Um, one song I sang and played piano and the other one I sang and played guitar. Um, the songs I wrote were Around, Around the House and the other song was called The Perfect Date for Me. Great title, I love it. So do we have other questions from the attendees, the webinar attendees? So please type them in the Q&A and we will post them to Michael and Terry. And while we wait uh, of the questions coming in, I actually want to know, Michael, what did you do with your $50,000? Did you do something fun for yourself? I am so curious. Well, one of the big things that I did with the money that I've earned was I bought a new car down in New Jersey. I I used to drive a uh, 2011 Honda Accord, but now I have a 2020 Honda CRV all wheel drive. Awesome. Uh, we're getting such such nice comments about all what all what you had to say across from all over the world, it looks like. So it's been a delight. Are there questions in the Q&A? We have one from Noreen here. She said, thank you so much and kudos to you for sharing and for all your accomplishments. I loved how you said you kept going and never would give up. Do you have any future goals you wish to accomplish, music or anything? Well, you know, um, my goal is to, you know, just, you know, to continue um, with the instruments I play, either if it's bass, piano, guitar. Um, I also, you know, um, I'm hoping to continue to like work with kids and um, people with disabilities. Um, and I'm hoping to, you know, maybe teach them how to play an instrument in the future and continue to work with adults on how to play piano. Um, so all the, all the stuff I'm doing now, it's really, it's really going well. And I'm looking forward to keeping it, keeping up the good work. That's wonderful, Michael. So we have one more question from Mary and that's for Terry. And then I will close out with two questions for you. So Mary says, Terry, what is the most valuable lesson Michael has taught you? You know, I think just that that love is the most important thing. Um, you know, I think all, as parents, we all try to always try to help and to, to we have to watch out not to try to fix. You know, just like what we do in hospice work, we want to create a space where beautiful things can happen and then hold that space rather than to be rushing in trying to do stuff or fix stuff or God forbid fix people. So I think, um, what it taught me was to be more patient and um you know just to be to love to love unconditionally uh and that all the stuff that happens externally is just stuff that happens externally but the important stuff that you know comes from within and michael and i talk about this all the time uh that's the stuff that really matters and in the end that's the stuff that really sustains us and keeps us going so thank you so much for that that question and um something that my friends, you know, Janice was talking about the other day, you know, not being so hard on yourself, you know, that, that uh, life is, you know, brings us what, we, what it brings us and there is not a lot of control that we have over it. So the more we can just ride with what comes and not try to control so much, just to be with things as they are and to love, always to love. So uh, that was one of his many great gifts to me. Thank you, Terry, that's beautiful. So I have one more question for you, Michael. I would like to know what gives you hope for artistic people seeking um, music therapy services or, you know, making music? What's your word of encouragement for, for people with autism spectrum disorder? I always want them to be, you know, happy when I uh, make music for them. 
my goal is to always, you know, brighten um, their lives with, you know, that kind of stuff. So I, I look forward to doing that more in the future too. Thank you so much, Michael. And closing out with the final question for Terry. Terry, what is your word of encouragement for our webinar attendees who serve individuals with autism spectrum disorder? Well, you know, I think, you know, just to um, stay open, you know, stay open and, and listen, really listen and look and, you know, work slowly. You know, if it might be, you know, two steps forward, one step back or two steps back and then one step back forward. Um, and again, it just to look at it as a, as a journey, something that that grows and evolves and will take on a life of its own at some point, you know, um, and to just keep going. I think uh, there's always a way uh, to find a way to, to, to keep going and to keep trying new things, um, stick with what works and let go of what doesn't. And try again, try to be really gentle with yourself um, that there will be mistakes. And but it's I always say to our students, you know, the mistakes and the difficulties are the things that really spur us on to be better at what we do, uh, because the struggle to understand and the struggle to find answers and solutions is what moves us forward. You know? Well, we're coming to an end of this week's webinar. Thank you so much, Michael and Terry. The Wonderful to have you at this webinar tonight. And thank you, Marsha. Next week, Marsha and I, we will have a conversation with Dr. Eugenia Hernandez-Ruiz and Esther Tan about family practice and tele-interventions. So I hope to see many of you again next week. And this webinar, we will also offer for free as it is the last of the ASD series this season. So have all a good night and see you another time. <laughs>